Hello everybody, uh, my name is Jason Miller, and uh, I want to thank you very much for having me to your Flight Sim Expo uh, here this afternoon. Uh, it's been really educational for me to walk around and see everything that's going on in the world of Flight Sims. I'm actually still trying to get my head around uh, who we have here, so if y'all don't mind, um, how many people here in the, in the group today are using simulators uh, for actual flight training or thinking about being pilots in the real world? All right, cool. And the rest of you, I'm gonna assume how many folks are just using it for fun? This is like an awesome way to entertain myself. Excellent. How many folks are actually already certificated pilots? Wow. All right, that's cool. That was by far the biggest group, by the way. Um, and I was out there, it's been 25 years since I have used a flight simulator. And I just did it next door in the room. I think I was using is it Infinite Flight. Is that the iOS one? And uh, I'll have you know, I landed a TDM 850. So I am living proof right here in front of you today that you can use actual airplanes to learn how to fly flight sims. <laughs> um, I am actually one of you all, though. You know, when I was eight, nine, ten, eleven years old, I don't want to date myself here, but the first flight simulator that I used was Sublogic. Does anyone remember that old like oh, two-tone yeah. kind of thing? Right. My brother thought I was crazy. I used to fly a Cessna real-time from Chicago Meigs Field to New York <laughs> on that little two-tone thing. So I remember when that became the Microsoft flight simulator mm -hmm. and uh, before I moved to California I was doing a lot of flying on it in the Bay Area so I can really um, relate to the feeling of showing up somewhere in the real world, somewhere I've never been before, and feeling like I've flown there already. You know, looking out, even with the, with the horrible graphics we had back then, my old floppy disk and my Apple IIe, I had felt like I'd flown in San Francisco. Uh, but now, that was years ago for me, that was 25 years ago, and as the video you just saw mentioned, what I do today is I teach flying um, almost every day of the week. I am a professional flight instructor, and I'm constantly in real airplanes with real students. Um, because I've been doing it for a long time, I charge a lot of money for what I do out there. Uh, the airplanes are very expensive, and I continually have the experience of looking at my students who are paying $270 an hour for the airplane and $100-something an hour for me, and um, thinking to myself, boy, they should be using simulators, right, if they're really serious about training. So really what I'm talking to you about today, before we um, bring my friend Steve up to talk from his perspective, what I'm going to try to tell you about a little bit is how you can most effectively use those simulators in real world training. Um, and the first thing that I tell pilots, whether they're using simulators or not, when they come in to learn how to fly, I'll generally tell them that actually flying the airplane is probably 20% of the challenge. So the, the journey that they're embarking on, learning how to become a pilot, Flying the airplane is really the least of it. We'll learn how to fly the airplane, I will teach them how to control the airplane, but really, we could get that done in 15, 20 hours, just the basics, right? The hard part to become a really precision pilot is all about standardization. And if you take your game to the next level, if you're gonna be an airline pilot, if you're gonna be a military pilot, if you're gonna be a cargo pilot, if you just wanna be an awesome pilot, you have to learn how to standardize your behavior in the airplane. And I think that this is an area where flight, uh, flight simulators can just earn their, earn their way into gold. Um, and what we're going to talk about here, I'm going to give you some specifics. I hope this isn't too nerdy for you, but I'm literally going to walk you through a flight and give you exact areas of flight training where I think standardization uh, is important. And it's not just me that thinks so. I can relate it back to the FAA. You know, to get your pilot certificate, we have to use the Airman Certification Standards. And the FAA has really tightened the screws on the airman certification standards, and they've really gone after a more professional approach. So if you look at, just as an example, if you look at the taxi task, where it says, you know, is this pilot, you got an examiner sitting next to you someday, looking at the pilot there and saying, is this pilot taxiing properly, or as per the ACS task? There's a note in there now that says they must have and use a taxi diagram. They must brief the taxi route. So half of my battle as an instructor when I'm sitting next to a student who's you know, taxiing is not necessarily is this person able to hold the center line, it's does this person have the discipline to get the taxi clearance, pull out a taxi diagram, 
brief me on the tax you out, all these little standardized behaviors, those are the things that in my opinion will make or break uh, a check ride, for example, and will also down the road contribute to safety. So let's talk about some of the areas where that shows up straight away. Engine start, right? So these are some of the obvious things, right? So I think the main point I'm trying to make is to disassociate initially from using the simulator as a tool to fly. And I know that's not good news for all the sim pilots. Everybody, the first thing they want to do is fly the airplane in the sim. But the first thing I'll tell my students if they're using a sim is put it on autopilot, don't try to fly it. It's not an airplane. It won't, well, I don't want to say it won't ever act like an airplane. I think we're getting closer and closer and closer when I see what, what's going on out here to building simulators that do, in fact, act like airplanes. Um, but for the most part, the simulators folks are using, you're better off thinking of it as a procedural trainer. And before I actually get into the specifics, I just wanted to point out that if you were on a path to professionalism, they would put you in what's called a procedural trainer. If you're a military pilot, an airline pilot, anything like that, They'll put you in a procedural trainer before they let you into the simulator, before they let you into the airplane. So you have to be able to sit down in a procedural trainer. It's just a simple mock-up. It's a cardboard mock-up of the cockpit. And you've got to be able to sit there and look at your start checklist and know where all the buttons are. If it were the military, they'd probably want you to do that blindfolded and know where things are, to know what your flow checks are, to know what the checklist says, not just for start, but for all the emergencies and and all this training that can be done before you ever even get to the simulator. Then, once you prove that you've got that stuff down, they'll let you go into the simulator, where you can then put that stuff to practice in maybe a full motion kind of level D simulator. Then, once you prove you've got it there, they'll let you get out to the airplane. Um, and this is not the sexy stuff. This isn't, um, this isn't particularly fun. But when I'm sitting next to a pilot that's paying $500 an hour for flight training, this is the stuff that burns the clock. This is the stuff where when we start up that airplane and you're on my dime and the meter's running on the plane and they go, okay, now, let's see. Fuel pump, where is the fuel pump? Right, like we just burned $25 looking for that fuel pump. Right, so if you're really concerned about streamlining the cost of training and being effective, um, we're gonna talk about the ways you can do that. So like we said, engine start is, is an obvious one. Know where those buttons are. Um, but then, there, if, you know, a good idea for anybody that is using a simulator for training is to go ahead and download the ACS, the Airman Certification Standards, and just walk through it. The next task is taxi. So you get that taxi clearance, and you want to make sure each time that you brief your passengers, you have a legal responsibility to brief your passengers, so give them a passenger briefing, get your taxi clearance, look at your taxi route, Brief the taxi route, literally say it out loud as if you're procedurally training, right? You're here in this simulator as a kind of a, a gym to build these muscles to get good at it. Then you pull forward, make sure you check your brakes. That's listed in the ACS. Did this applicant ask the examiner to check brakes? Make sure you do that. While you're taxiing, make sure you're checking those turning instruments. You know, is your heading indicator increasing when you turn to the right? Is it decreasing when you turn to the left? Is the attitude indicator staying stable? Finally, you know, you get out to the uh, to the to the run-up area. You sit there, park the airplane there for a minute, and go through the full engine run-up, right? Just like it says on the checklist. Before you depart, you want to do a pre-takeoff briefing. Right? We haven't even come close to flying the airplane yet, but I promise you've got a month's worth of work to do right there in the simulator. Right? That's a lot of repetition and a lot of practicing. And that's the stuff, this is what I'm telling you from the right seat, from 20 years ago, that's the stuff that will streamline the time, that will make the lesson go faster, will save you hundreds and hundreds of dollars in training, will also have it reflect when the examiner sits down next to you, they're gonna look at you and say, wow, this person's sharp, they're on it, they ask me to check their brakes, they're doing the briefings, they're, you know, all this pre-takeoff briefing and stuff like that, right? It's not the no examiner's gonna sit there and go, wow, look how smooth they are on the rudders, you know, like during the taxi. Look how look how smooth and effectively they brake. You know, maybe they will. They'll notice if you're riding the brakes. Um, but there we are in the run-up area, and now we're getting in front of the airplane, we're thinking, okay, we do a pre-takeoff briefing, we get on the runway, we can practice our takeoff call-outs, power is set, gauge is checked, airspeed alive, VR, rotate, right? All the stuff you're gonna do on the climb out. 
Remember to keep a, a sterile cockpit, that is, don't, don't talk about anything else until you're up to a thousand feet. And now you're flying out to the practice area. On your way out, I teach my students for every climb, at this point the engine's running, they should be doing a flow check to make sure that they didn't miss anything for the climb. And in a single pilot environment, as a second step, they should back that up with a written checklist. I'm so uh, adamant about this with my students that I literally keep notes on how many they hit and how many they miss. I've got a little shorthand for it so that I can tell them at the end of any given flight, you hit 42% of your checklist, but only 30% were backed up, right? So the way for them to get good at it is not to go, oh man, I only hit 42%, well hopefully I'll do better next week. No, the way the military would approach it is to go sit them down in a room in front of a picture of the cockpit, or better yet, a flight simulator, a PC-based flight simulator, and practice it, just climbing out to the practice area, running my flow check, doing my checklist. I level off for cruise flight, I run my flow check, I do my checklist. Um, starting a descent, I run my flow check, and I do my checklist. Don't underestimate the significance of this behavior in the airplane. It's, it's critical. I, always, I joke with my students when they come in, I say, I have two goals for you. One is that you pass your check ride on the first attempt. The second is that you never die in an airplane. And those, are, those goals are aligned. They're one and the same. The things that I'm teaching there about flow checks and checklists not only will have them acing check rides, have examiners like building a story in their head that this pilot is exceedingly well prepared, but it will also have them be the first person on board the day they look at the engine gauges and the oil pressure is starting to fail, right? Or the ammeter has gone to the negative side of zero. So these behaviors are critical. Um, there was an airline pilot, Al Haynes, the pilot, the captain of United 232, if anyone's familiar with that crash, but he went around and did a lecture series talking about how on the day of the accident, the entire crew, and keep in mind this is a two-person crew, very different from a single pilot environment, but the entire crew that day behaved like a, you know, like a well-oiled machine, and he had never met them. Not any of them. Not the first officer, not Danny Finch, like he didn't even know them before that day. And he credits United Airlines and their standardization program and the procedures that they teach. So the stuff that I'm talking about to my students is stuff that this isn't, I didn't make it up, right? I, I just borrow it from the professional world. And this is the direction the FAA is trying to take general aviation. They're trying to really tighten the screws and bring us more toward a professional type training environment. And this is where simulators really come into play. And notice I have not talked yet about which one flies the best or most realistic. And that, at this point yet, is still not that important to you. Um, if we're going out to the practice area to just do some maneuvers, and I've had this conversation with a couple people here today when I'm walking around the hall, I say things like, well, is there anybody out there in the simulator world that's sort of teaching like I'm talking here, that's just sort of doing day one, day two lesson, day three lesson, day four. Today we're going out to the practice area to work on stalls. And when I start talking about that, what most people hear is, well, you know, the, air, you know, the simulator doesn't really behave like an airplane, right? Like, everybody's thinking flying. But I can tell you when, you know, that's really, again, that's 20% of the problem. The things that people miss, in my experience, when I'm doing phase checks, or if I'm talking to examiners, the things that people miss when they go out to do a stall series is they forget to lean the mixture, or they'll forget to do a clearing turn, right? These are the things where the examiner starts thinking, oh man, we're fully ridged, we're at 5,000 feet, we're gonna follow the spark plugs, we didn't do any clearing turns, this guy can run into another airplane, so it doesn't matter how awesome your stall was. And to be quite honest, stalling assessment is not all that hard. Like, we'll figure that part out. So again, the place you can practice this is in your simulator. You can go out to the practice area, even if you're on autopilot. Like, even if you just have one that doesn't behave very much like an airplane. Better if it does, I suppose. Um, all it will do if it behaves a lot like an airplane is sort of load up your processor a little bit more realistically, where you have to divide your attention between one of the things I'm talking about and maybe holding altitude. But if flying the sim becomes so much of a challenge that a large majority of your attention is going toward flying, I would say put it on autopilot. Abandon that part of it for the purposes of what I'm talking about, for the purposes of training, um, speeding up your training, and maybe going for some more precise training. So you can go out, say, on your stall series and get to 5,000 feet, do your flow check, lean your mixture, 
run through your checklist, do a clearing turn, you know, 90 degrees to the left like the FAA says, and then 90 degrees back on heading. Even say to yourself, okay, then I did a stall. You don't even have to do it. You can do it if you want. If you have a sim that's good, some of these are pretty amazing. If you've got one you think is up for it, do a stall. But if not, if it's going to be a big thing, just, okay, I did a stall. Stall's over, another flow check, another checklist. You know, what's next, Jason, or what's next, examiner? And eventually you turn around and fly back to the airport. The examiner or check pilot, or if me, if you're ever flying with me, we're going to be looking for things like, did you do an arrival briefing? Did you consider how long the runway is? Did you do a gumps check? You know, gas, undercarriage, mixture, propeller, power, pumps, seatbelt, security, uh, before landing checklist. Did you do a descent check? You know, and none of this again relates to how did you know how were you able to fly your simulator? So, um, I don't want to beat a dead horse there, but I think that kind of wraps up the VFR point that I'm trying to make, which is. The simulator has an incredible value as a procedural trainer, and that's an area where I see most pilots sort of blow it off. And we as CFIs will, co will coach people and say, hey, do some couch flying, is what we call it, or do some dry time, you know, come down to the airport on a Saturday and sit in the airplane, but don't start the engine, because this stuff's expensive. And this is where a good simulator set up at home and a disciplined usage of it uh, for the purposes of flight training can make a huge impact. Because if you're doing all that stuff in the sim, and then you do go out on your lesson, it's going to be in your primacy. It's going to be in your, um, there's two laws of learning that are real powerful here. One is the law of primacy. The way you do it the first time is the way you'll tend to remember it. And then um, the law of exercise. The way you practice something is the way you're going to perform something, right? So those are powerful laws of learning, and you can use a simulator for that. Um, one other point that I want to make before we uh, bring up Steve Thorne is um, about IFR flying. Is anybody flying IFR or just thinks about flying IFR in the sim? Okay. This is an area where I would say feel free to use the simulator. And I just want to admit to everybody in the room that in today's world, with today's avionics, if I'm getting a brand new instrument student, we use the autopilot in the airplane to start. So the first third of training we will be flying the airplane on autopilot. We will be using, if it's got a fancy GPS system, we will be talking about programming the GPS. We will put the airplane on autopilot and we will both watch the airplane fly the flight. Because the hard part about instrument flying is not any one task. Right, there's this old analogy about instrument flying or this old image people use where they say, you know, flying instruments is a little bit like, like a juggler, you know, and you can get, three or four or five balls going in the air and someone throws you a sixth ball, you can even maybe get that one going because you're the best juggler in the world and maybe you got seven balls going and eventually someone throws you a ball and you don't miss that last ball, but the whole house of cards comes down, right? All seven balls hit the floor and you can't even remember your name, right? I joke with students, you know, there will come a point where I'll ask you what your name is and you will turn to me and say, stand by. Right? You won't even be able to like, hear that question. And that's an important place to find in instrument training. So what you want to focus on more in instrument training is a system, a method by which you can process that information, a way to think in front of the airplane. So if you've got a complicated departure procedure, for example, um, you know, San Carlos has one where we take off, San Carlos, California, and we take off and we have to climb straight ahead to 1,100 feet and then we have to make a right turn to a certain heading so we cross the radial. Then we go up to 2,100, we contact departure, and by five minutes later we have to go up to 5,000. There's a whole procedure involved with it. Um, again, don't waste too much of your attention in the simulator trying to fly that and hold those altitudes precisely within 50 feet or 100 feet. That's a, kind of a, a waste of that juggling energy. What would be a better use is to go ahead and put it on the autopilot, hold those altitudes, and start thinking in front of the airplane. Okay, so in, you know, in one mile, I'm gonna have to turn right. When I get there, I'll be turning this thing, and then we'll be climbing, and I'll have to enrich in the mixture, and maybe hit the fuel pump, and I'll have to run my checklist, and practice thinking in front of the airplane with all the little points that you'll have to encounter on an IFR flight. All right. Do you guys have any questions for me about anything that I've said so far? Yeah? Uh, 
another thing I might throw in for CFR that I found really helpful is a head tracker. So Which is it, sir? Uh, head, head tracking device. Okay, awesome. To be able to see, to be able to apply a pattern, basically. Okay, so yeah, the gentleman in front was saying that one thing he finds really valuable is a head tracking device. I'm not too familiar. Does that, by the way, record where you're looking and when you're looking there? Yeah, it puts a little camera. Track IR. Yeah, track IR. Track IR is what he's yeah. Interesting. Um, okay, that's awesome.